So thank you, James, for uh, taking the time to, to come and have a, a chat on camera with me. Um, we were talking about some uh, really good topics over the last couple of weeks, just in sort of private conversation. And uh, it, it's good now to sort of be able to get those on camera and uh, share those thoughts with a, a wider group of people. So uh, thanks very much for taking the time. My pleasure, Andy. So well, before we get into those subjects, I thought for the benefit of those who perhaps know me but don't know you, um, you know, tell us about yourself and how you came through accountancy to what you're doing now. Whenever people ask me this question, Andy, I, I sometimes try and do it a different way. So, yeah, you know, whenever whenever someone asks you who are you, people will tend to revert to the job that you do. Yeah. Or what I try and do as a starting point now is trying to explain who I am in three words. The first one is a carer, so I care for my father full time. Second, I'm an adventurer, so I do love my bit of travel. And yeah. thirdly, I'm, I, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm an academic. Um, right. It'd be great if I could pronounce that correctly, but <laughs> uh, turn, and you can probably see via the, the books I have. So I love learning. Um, and I suppose in terms of where I was getting into the profession, Andy, it was always the academic element or the academic piece of me that wanted to push through with that. So yeah. in terms of getting into the profession, I'd done A-level accounting, I'd done a degree in accounting, I'd done a master's degree in accounting, and then I became a chartered accountant with right. in 2006. So I'd done my training contract with, with GT for three years. Yeah, And in terms of the profession itself, it was always something I wanted to do because somebody in my careers class in school went, oh, you can get loads of money becoming an accountant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That good old stereotype. Um, so essentially, that's one of the reasons why I went for it. I was very good at maths. Um, and it's one of those natural things that you progress into, albeit that you don't have to be good at maths to be a good accountant either. Yeah. But yeah, so I developed within Grant Thornton. I loved being a trainee. I was in within audit for three years. Whenever I qualified, um, I was told that that I was quite good at it, quite good at auditing, and hence there was a career progression into senior management within the firm. Yeah. And potentially I could have that they seen some partnership potential in me. That's so good. Yeah, and so there was, basically they were saying, James, if you want to work for this in five years, you can be a partner within the firm. Mm. And that was great. I seen pound signs. I, I seen the money. But audit is a tough job. And being a partner in audit is a tough job, and you really, really have to love it. And... You also, if you want to be a partner in a firm, you have to really live and breathe that. Yeah. And I found out that I didn't want to do, I didn't want to go into it as much as that or as deep into, yeah. into that. So I was in senior management then for five years and I left Grant Thornton in 2012. Approximately, well, I was approximately there about nine and a half, ten years. Yeah. Went and left, left um, the um, practice and went into industry for the first time. And I went in as financial controller of WKD, the alcoholic drink. Yeah. And if anybody knows WKD, it's that blue stuff in a bottle. Mm, yeah. um, given the fact that I don't drink, I thought that was quite hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and, and an Irish man that doesn't drink at that, which is another one. <laughs> oh, that is something. <laughs> yeah, it is. So I went into it and it was like out of the frying pan into the fire, Andy, because... The company was hundreds of millions of turnover mm. um, and it had hundreds of staff and my first role in the industry was being financial controller of this company. Yeah. Um, huge baptism of fire, but really enjoyed it because I, I learned a lot commercially. Yeah. A massive amount commercially, which is something you don't really get in practice. In practice, you look at systems and you look at all that sort of stuff. From an audit perspective, you see loads of companies, you deal with loads of people but you yeah. didn't actually get underneath the skin to understand how it works. Yeah. So that was a great learning tool for me. Yeah. Um, then I left and went into government. So I was a financial controller within um, government. And then 
lo and behold, through circumstances, I took a career break um, about two and a half years ago. But Accounting Success Coach was born about a year before that, where I woke up with an idea, which was helping others getting through their exams. Yeah. And lo, lo and behold, I developed that idea, and now it's a fully functioning business. Excellent. So that was, was a real, yeah, and no doubt we'll talk about other aspects of of where I've been in the profession. So that's really, I've always been in the profession, but essentially, Andy, what I've learned through all that journey was I get my job satisfaction with helping other people. Yeah, exactly. And and how are things with um, James Perry, the accounting success coach? I mean, what, is there anything new on the horizon that uh, that people might be interested in, or uh, can't you well, say much about that now? What I no, well, what I discovered was that. Um, so in terms of that one idea that I woke up, I woke up in the middle of the night with the idea, and, I, and then one of the best things I'd done was changing LinkedIn from what was an online CV three and a half years ago to then promoting myself. And yeah. throughout that period of time, I've coached over 130 people around the world. Mm. However, what I did find that was that people were qualifying and then I never seen them again. Right. So where I was, where I was, and I was called accounting exam coach then. Yeah. Whereas I'm now called accounting success coach because I am now adding and I'm developing a career coaching aspect to the business, yeah. where I've had to create my career essentially by myself and create this business by myself. So I've done things the hard way, yeah. and this career coaching essentially is very useful in terms of look i've made every mistake possible and if i can help you through talking you through some of the mistakes and put some of the successes that i have went through yeah hopefully you can propel your your career forward um so i'm in the middle of developing that an 18 module course that sounds brilliant right well maybe and, and we'll definitely pick up on the uh, the coaching uh, side of things later on because that's uh, one of the things I want to sort of draw out um, but first of all you know, what, going back to the accounting qualification I mean um, what, do, what do you think is the value of the accounting qualification and what opportunities and rewards do you see there for uh, accountants once they uh, qualify um, both in terms of uh, personal rewards in, in terms of career and um, but also making a difference in business Absolutely. Um, well, I'll, t I'll actually tell you, I'll take you right back to the start with me and how okay. this, how, how, what my incentive was to, to do well. Mm -hmm. So um, in the north of Ireland here, there is what was called the transfer test. It was actually called the 11 plus exam, right? which was the exam you took the final year of primary school to see yeah. whether you're going to go to a high school or a grammar school. And a lot of people took that exam, but I failed it absolutely point blank failed they got the lowest grade right now that wasn't necessarily the problem the problem was where my good old decrepit headmaster came into my face and told me but james you weren't going to pass it because you're not particularly bright right and that was the age of 11 10 or 11 so i went with my first core motivation in my life was to prove that guy wrong yeah so i went through high school and i did prove him wrong so i became I think I was fifth in GCSEs. I was fifth in school. And I was the, the number one male in the school. Excellent. Um, so that was the first thing. I then went through A-levels, aced that. And the big one for me, Andy, was I got a first class degree in accounting. So right. in a class of 200, there was four in the first, and I was one. Hmm. All with that one key core motivator. Yeah. So the first thing I would say to someone in terms of doing qualifications in accounting is that that's an achievement that is possibly one of my greatest achievements and that no one can take away from me now that I can say to people, I got a first class degree in accounting. Yeah. Which, which isn't an easy thing. It's definitely not an easy thing. So the first point on the of personal satisfaction and then going from that to become a fully qualified professional. Yeah. And getting, that, get, getting those letters of ACA after your name and now FCA, mm -hmm. that is a huge personal achievement for me, especially coming from that point of age of 10 to say, James, you're not going to do any good. Yeah. 
So from a personal standpoint, it's fantastic. And also when you look at it, Andy, how many people in terms of a global population can get this world-class professional qualification? I exactly. Wouldn't think of that many. Wouldn't think of that many. No, that's right. Uh, uh, that's what I, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that's what I talk about, you know, you know, the good old Pareto principle, the 20%, you know, 80-20 rule. Yeah. Where I talk about the 4% rule. Do you want to be the 20% of the 20%? Mm. And that's what I've always been. That's what I have always wanted to strive, strive towards. Yeah. So yeah. from a personal standpoint, there's anyone watching here, do you want to be the 4% and get a world-class professional qualification? So that's from a personal standpoint. Yeah. From a professional standpoint, in audit, I have to say, the very tough, audit department is very tough. It's known to be tough. Yeah. But seeing so many businesses, seeing so many systems, meeting so many personalities, mm. developing my people skills in terms of, we have to go and talk to so many clients. Yeah. It's a fantastic breeding ground for business. Yeah, it so is. So you, you do get a general feel for business. Um, also, if you're a trainee in terms of being an in industry, and I had a number of trainee accountants under my, under my, my guys, I suppose, whenever I was in industry, again, it's a fantastic profession for getting yeah. on this, for, for, for seeing what business is all about. So, and you, you obviously know this, this in terms of finance being the eyes and ears of business. Yeah. So in terms of, Andy, there's very few qualifications that, that make you see how business ticks. Um, so that's again from a from a professional perspective the reason why why it's such a great qualification to have. Yeah, I agree, and um, I, I I agree with your point about the sort of auditing makes you go and talk to people, and there's <laughs> there's a lot of people who talk about you know finance business partnering and uh, you know get out from behind your desk and go and talk to people in the business. Well, it, actually, auditors have already done that, and yeah. uh, so I think there's a there's a great opening for ex-auditors who want to come into business and be finance business partners because they're already used to talking to people in the business. Um, if, if I think they've got that sort of uh, chat, chat with the business and start to get that understanding as well. One, one thing I would say, one of my key strengths, Andy, I would say would be my rapport building and my trust building. Yeah. 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 Uh, and people, I think I'm quite good at this. I take this skill from my father where I believe I can make people very comfortable with me very, very quickly. Yeah. And I, I believe the skill starts from the fact that you're not going to go and talk about finance straight away. Yeah. So, for example, whenever I was an auditor, by going to a client and, or, or, or whenever I was in industry, going to the operations team mm. or accounts payable team or whatever, and going and saying, well, how are you doing today? How's yeah. your family? Where, do you think it, where, where are you going to go on holiday this year? Yeah. I'm, make, I'm building that level of rapport straight away. Yeah, you can't. You tend to get a lot more information then from people after exactly. you've built that. So after you've had that, you don't have to go all guns blazing and be this ruthless accountant if no. you act as a person. So therefore, Andy, I was able to get as an auditor, as a trainee, I got so much information out of clients mm. by simply being normal and human. That's, a, that's exactly right. I mean, I was. Uh... I've always been a bit introverted, to be honest. And uh, uh, one of my audit seniors, when I was uh, training, actually said to me, uh, he said, you've got to de develop a little bit of chat. Um, you know, you're going in too direct. You just need to have a little bit of chat and, uh, you know, put people at ease and make people understand that you're a human being as well and not just an annoying auditor. So, uh, 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 that's the stereotype that, that auditors always have to get around. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. uh, and that's and I learned that quite a bit. If you can build the rapport of someone, and, and rapport is actually deeper than trust. So trust yeah. prob probably is saying, okay, there's James. James is very good at doing what he says, so I trust him. Yeah. But rapport is a, very, is a slightly deeper thing. It's, it, it gets a bit more deep. We actually build a likability, or you can build this connection with somebody. And if yeah. you can do that much more, you're going to get lots more in return from that. Yeah, that's so a really good point, actually. I think it's a key thing, especially for us stereotypical accountants. And that's yeah. a stereotype. Whereas you're quite right, Andy, in saying 
uh, maybe I've said this before, are we going to be called accountants anymore? Mm. I don't know. I don't think we are in the next four or five years. We might all be called business partners, irrespective right. of what, what element of the profession you're in. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Well, I think, I, think, I think the numbers are going to take care of themselves, generally. Yeah, well, there's certainly a lot of uh, accounting tasks that are going to be uh, increasingly automated. So, uh, so perhaps you're right. I mean, in terms of the, uh, um, do you think accountants sometimes fail to recognize the, uh, or appreciate that qualification and the skills that they've got and actually the, the power of it? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, whenever I'm talking about um, developing the career, um, the first aspect is called, uh, the first module is called the dynamic attitude approach. And it is that mindset of developing yeah. your career. So to actually understand that this qualification isn't necessarily all about you being an accountant. Yeah. The way I look at it, Andy, is this qualification is a springboard to go and do what you want to do with your career. Yeah. So that's right. I, I, people tend to forget that. They, they really do. It's what I say to my clients who are just doing their exams. Mm. It's, uh, and whenever I ask them that, the very first question I ask in any session is, why are you doing this? Yeah. And they don't know because no one has ever asked them that question. Why are you doing these really hard exams? <laughs> and it's like what I say, Andy, it's like getting a big rubber stamp and stamping credibility over your forehead. That's what yeah. I think this qualification is. Yeah, I mean, do you think people just say they don't have an idea why they're doing the exams because uh, actually they're embarrassed because, like what you said, it's like sometimes they just think they're going to have a really uh, financially rewarding career and actually it's all about money at that stage. And I was the same 10 years ago, Andy. Whenever I was, whenever I had, actually, whenever I was 28, so 12 years ago, 20, 13 yeah. years ago, whenever I had that carrot dangled in front of my eyes in terms of partnership, all I wanted was was this two hundred thousand pounds salary a year, but then whenever you see, whenever you actually see that it's a vocation, you know you have to have that vocation rather than the job, so it is something more than just the salary. Yeah, and I think you have to be in it to to realise it sometimes. Absolutely. So I didn't see what partnership was like until I got to associate director level. Didn't yeah. understand what what was involved. Didn't know what networking was. <laughs> you know, didn't know that you had to be a, a people manager as well as network with clients, as well as be at your clients back and call twenty four seven, as well yeah. as being this this leader of the entire organization, as yeah. well as being a salesman, which <laughs> what it's all about. You know, partnership is being a salesman and trying to get as much work as possible yeah. into the firm. So. It's all these things you don't really see. Yeah, exactly. So what would you say are the top few things um, qualified accountants should be thinking about when they're considering their next steps and their career progression, whether they're in, in practice or whether they're in industry, they're just, you know, just qualified, you know, what, what do you think they should be thinking about in terms of their next steps? Number one is thinking about their mindset. So are they fixed or are they a growth mindset? Right. And I know that's a very much a buzzword at the minute, this growth mindset mm. thing. But I think up to five years ago, I was very much of the fixed mindset where yeah. I just were. I think it's very, very um, easy for us accountants to have a fixed mindset because mm. of the way we are built logically. And it is to think that, okay, if there's a problem, you know, how, how, how do you... It's to see things essentially as opportunities not obstacles Andy and I think yeah. because we're quite conditioned especially by the firms and by the profession sometimes we're not maybe as creative as what we could be yeah because we're logical to say oh that's right or that's wrong I think it's all it's because of that kind of um success mindset if you like in terms of you know like you say uh giving you that two hundred thousand pound partnership uh, potential and then you feel like if you don't reach that you failed somehow and that and then you're a failure and um, you know that's the essence of really the fixed mindset isn't it it's kind of you get to a certain level and if you can't get any further then you must be a failure and it must be all it's, it's all about you 
Whereas if you've got that growth mindset, it's kind of, well, you know, what was the obstacle? You know, let's, let's find a way around this and let's find a, a way around the next one and the next one. It's, it's a bit like what I would maybe challenge people to say, everybody should start their own business because yeah. you need to have a growth mindset in order to try and, and succeed in that. So I went from being very much the academic, pure academic, yeah. where I've had to become a marketer. I'm learning yeah. to become a salesman. Mm. I had, I've had to develop my courses from scratch. I have yeah. had to make those tough phone calls to corporates and go, hey, I'm here. I've had to show my vulnerability on LinkedIn yeah. and actually yeah. put myself out there and potentially mm. be, be criticized. So it's all about that initial mindset to go, are you ready to develop your career to where you want to go? Not necessarily where society wants to take you. Yeah. And are you willing to get your hands dirty to go and network with the right people, to go and write that blog on LinkedIn, to go and mm. put yourself your head above the parapet, to go and perhaps have this interview or to go and create your own podcast. It, it, it's really, uh, the profession is fantastic at giving you that credibility, but what's the other stuff you need to do to take those steps forward to develop your career? And having the right growth mindset, I think is step number one. The yeah. most crucial step in doing that. Yeah. So what else would you say? Is there anything else you'd say on top of that? There's, again, that rapport building. Work yeah. on dealing with people. Yeah. I've, I've actually, funny, I downloaded the audio book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> now, I've already read that book. Right. And, and I know people are saying it's a fantastic book. I didn't see the attraction of the book. Mm. the reason why I say that is because a lot of that stuff becomes automatic to me. Right. So by having the initial conversation, by we've got the saying in Ireland, having a bit of crack. Yeah. C-R-R-I-C, which is the yeah. Irish for entertainment, storytelling, fun. Yeah. And I love having the crack. <laughs> so what I would do, Andy, is I would always have a bit of crack. I'd always have a bit of fun or storytelling with someone before I get the business. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's the reason why that book didn't have a huge, massive impact on me because it comes naturally to me. Yeah. Now, if it doesn't come naturally to me or to you, who's ever listening, our listeners or viewers, go yeah. and read that book. Yeah. It's a, I mean, the, the title makes it sound a bit sort of uh, cheap and cheesy, but actually it's a classic uh, book about... Absolutely. You know, and, and, and the essence is really show interest in people rather than trying to always talk about yourself. Absolutely. So that's, that's, that's the second one, uh, is to, build, to learn how to build rapport with people. Third one yeah. is to delegate. And that's an incredibly difficult thing for me mm. to do. Because right. good old uber perfectionist James can't, let, can, can't give up control of certain things. Yeah. Because I know if I do it, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, uh, is that part of being the 20% of the 20% absolutely, the, the flip side of that I remember Andy going to the interview for WKD to become financial controller of yeah. uh, a multi-million pound organisation and the group finance director asked me a question and says James what's your greatest strength and I said I'm a perfectionist what you will get from me is it will be a fantastic product and I went thanks very much James, what's your greatest weakness? And I went, I'm a perfectionist <laughs> because I will beat myself up massively if I do not get something right. Yeah. Now, again, going back to the old, good old 80 20 rule, Andy, your 80% is someone else's perfection. Yeah. I've been told that saying, and you're going, there's actually something to that. Mm. So if you get something to 80%, it's actually good enough. Yeah. So that's something I've had to really learn and delegation is a part of that. Yeah. Because if you can delegate effectively and get something done to really well, not, per not perfect, but really well, that normally works. And, yeah. and they learn something from it as well. Absolutely. Which helps you absolutely. in the long run, helps them. Absolutely. So that's certainly the, the third one. Um, I'm not necessarily gonna talk about the fifth one yet because that's mentoring. I'll we'll probably talk over that in a second. Yeah. The fourth one, the fourth one um, is what I, I've actually got a module around this called the, the, the 3D Reading Roadmap. 
And okay. what do I mean by that? It's a, it's, a, it's a module that I put together that we have to process data and information all the time. Mm. So how can we read to become more efficient and more effective and to take that information on board? Because I believe a crucial thing, Andy, is that to become really good in your career, you need to make better decisions faster. Yeah. So how can you read and, or how can you take on board information more efficiently, effectively? I think that's a key skill that tends to pass people by. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I remember the office managing partner, Grant Thornton. He was the first person who ever told me in terms of skim reading. Right. He could, he could read a set of accounts or he could read an audit closeout document and pick out issues like that. And that's a that, skill you have to develop. Yeah, I think, and, and um, some of that comes with experience, but there, there must be a technique. I'm, I'm, to be honest, in terms of experience, I'm, uh, I'm all right at that. So uh, I, I used to get annoyed with partners when I was in uh, practice who, you know, you'd open the set of accounts in front of them and they'd immediately, within seconds, tell you what was wrong. And I was like, how can you tell? Um, but then, you know, Five, ten years later, I was the one sitting in my office as a finance director, uh, you know, management accounts come in front of me and I go, sorry, that's wrong. <laughs> and you see the financial controller and just go, how did you notice? And, uh, you, you know, you, you get that by experience. But in terms of reading things, um, like if I read a book, I, I, I'm still really slow, actually. And I, I get to the end and I'm thinking, oh, there's so much in there that I wish I could remember. Um, and I have to reread it. So uh, perhaps I'd better go on your course. <laughs> two, two, two couple of quick tips on that. This sounds really childish. I do have a book here. Yeah, I do. By the way, that's an excellent book there, if anybody can. The Personal NBA by Josh Kaufman. Really, really good book. But one thing that I tend to do is I tend to, I don't know if you can see that there, but I tend to highlight my books. Ah, yeah which my father hates. <laughs> but a really, really good tip is whenever you're reading is to put your finger along that. It's called meta tracking. So therefore, you don't, do you know whenever you read something, but you drift whenever you read and you have to yeah. backtrack and read yeah. it again. By putting your finger physically along the line, and it seems childish, but it works. So that means if you focus what you're reading on. The second one, if you're listening to something, maybe an audio book, have yeah. it at one, 1. 1.25 speed. It goes right. slightly quicker, so you have yeah. to listen harder. Ah. And you have to focus better. I do that all the time with my audio books. So instead of, again, letting it drift over you, you're a wee bit more concentrated by listening. That's a really good uh, tip. You're right, actually. Uh, now I think about it. You do concentrate more when things are going faster. And I, I often put uh, things like that on in YouTube videos and stuff like that on 1.25 or 1.5 just to get through them quicker. Um, but actually, you're right. I realize that you do concentrate more if, you, if you've got it quicker as well. I tell my exam students that technique as well in terms of studying. Excellent. Good. So let's talk about some uh, um, coaching and mentoring and things like that. So you coach a lot of people. You, you talked about like 130 odd people you've, yep. you've coached. Um, why typically do, uh, do people come to you for coaching? Oh, there is a number of reasons. First of all, number one is the, the accountability. Right. Um, people tend to find the accountability to be really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, the next bit and I suppose is some guidance and some direction because especially if you're talking say if you're talking about exam coaching yeah. and there's all this information in front of you a lot of people cannot see the wood for the trees right so therefore by getting some guidance it's uh, I'll give you an example I'll give you a quick story my yeah. first ever VAT return I'd done for WKD was yeah. multi multi millions and I was a wee bit, I don't know how to put it politely, but I was a wee bit intimidated by it. Let's put it like that. Right. And my, my boss, who was divisional financial controller, absolutely fantastic man. Yeah. And he, he said to me the good old saying, James, you can't eat an elephant in one bite. You do it in bite-sized chunks. Yeah. 
So you get the output report, you get the input report, you get the EC sales report, whatever you do. Yeah. And then you paste them together and take a, take a, a sense check over it all. Sure. And that has always stayed with me. So therefore, in terms of coaching or mentoring with me, a lot of people see it as you have to eat the elephant in one bite. So I put it into some sort of process as well and break it down into bite-sized chunks. So there's certainly, there's a number of it. And also maybe I put a bit of structure to it um, yeah. where I can hold them accountable. So you're saying it's, um, it's kind of like um, people come along and they're, they're kind of overawed by this uh, big task. They've got to become a qualified accountant and you kind of help them break it down into chunks of like what to do now and next and then after that and a way to think about it. That, Us that good, good old Carton and Sandy should love process. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. we should love logic and we should love having a plan. Yeah. But whenever it comes to your own exams that's very personal to you and emotions get in the way all logic clears off out the window yeah exactly emotion then runs uh, it creates havoc with what you want to do mm. so what i try and do through my um past protocol course is to try and make that into a, a system or make it into a process and yeah. have that plan in place so that's where the coaching comes in and works quite well. So I try and explain a bit about why the emotion is there and, and how do you overcome that and how do you then get a process in place to, to succeed. Um, so it works really well, actually. A lot of people have got benefit from that coaching. Yeah, I mean, what, I mean, what difference do you think coaching makes? I mean, why, why do you think, I mean, do you think more people should actually be uh, looking at coaching as a, or getting some coaching. Um, Absolutely. Um, there, there's a number of, I put certain words to, to coaching and, and the benefits of that. Yeah. Uh, but the, that, this will be exam focused or career focused, Andy. Yeah. There's lots of different things that does it. So, in terms of, uh, and I'll, let's just say I'll call, for the sake of it, I'll call coaching and mentoring. Let's just call it one thing at the moment in terms yeah. of, of being, being a sister or help. So I would call, for example, being the gardener. So the coach stroke mentor helps you grow and develop. Yeah. It's also maybe the goal setter. So a coach or mentor will help you reach your goals. Also maybe the facilitator where the coach or mentor will enable you through who they know or will, will point those sort of things out in terms of you know, trying to build those connections and trying to get that network built. Yeah. Um, loads of things. In terms of maybe maybe they're the prompter. So they'll give you a mixture of, of their advice, but also facilitate you coming up with some answers yourself. Yeah. So there, I see tons and tons of benefits of this coaching and mentoring. Um, a common one I see as well as being a sounding board. Lots yeah. of my clients, lots of my clients, both in terms of exams and career, aren't they? They know the answers. Yeah. But by having that sounding board, they can create their own solutions. And then by having a coach or mentor to be an accountability partner, yeah, they're then held accountable to those solutions. Yeah. So yeah. I find it incredibly beneficial. I've had a number of of coaches, stroke mentors over the years. Anything from emotional to spiritual to mm. business to, you know, it's helped me enormously to yeah. help see things from different angles as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th and I think that's, um, it's funny, I was thinking about this earlier because I saw a video by um, Simon Sinek and uh, he was talking about mentoring and he was talking about uh, men uh, the relationship he's got with his uh, mentor. And he was saying that um, it's become more of a friendship over the years. Um, but I was thinking actually, uh, the, where you move beyond friendship, um, with a mentor is that accountability part, because you can go and ask a friend for advice, but there's no accountability. There's no, you know, the mentor will then take it and, uh, say, right, what are you going to do? And the same with coaching, coaching and mentoring, that the last question in a, in like a coaching or mentoring session is, is more, more likely. So what are you going to do? Um, and you know, once you've said what you're going to do, they're going to be asking you whether you've done it. And so it creates that 
accountability. Whereas if you just ask a friend for advice, it's kind of take it or leave it. And the thing is with getting the right coach or mentor, whichever word you want to use. I know, yeah. I know the coaching is more short term and mentoring is more longer term. And, but just looking for that person, let's just say. Yeah. The choice is up to you. But the thing is, is that you may need to go and hunt or you may need to have a lot of coaches yeah. to actually fall on the right person. Because, you know, what, what you want or what I always wanted was someone who's been there and done that yeah. in, my fe- in my field. Yeah. It's very difficult. They're very difficult to find. But also someone who not only do I respect, but someone who's respected in their genre or with their own peers. Yeah. And one, one, one thing that and I've got, actually, I could actually say I've got a number of coaches and mentors now who are, yeah. because one, for example, one really good friend of mine showed me how to network properly. I didn't yeah. know how to do it. Mm-hmm. I had this great re- skill of building rapport, but I didn't know how to network effectively because yeah. I was going to the wrong people. Right. And, uh, and that's where he showed me, no, James, it's, it's different. You have to go and find like-minded people yeah. and you go and hang about with them and you build rapport and you do, you know, he was the first person who told me about, I have to pronounce this right, the law of reciprocity. Yes. Yeah. What, what you get, you receive back. And he was the one who told me about this. Um, so I've been lucky to find a load of different people um, who have acted as those people in different elements, but they have to be not only respected by you, but by others. Yes. Uh, because how you grow as well, especially in your career, is not just by your relationship with your mentor, but by the people that they know. And, you know, I, I've, written, I've written an ebook about this where mm. and the title of the ebook is It's Not What You Know. Mm. It's, not, it's not who you know. It's who yeah. knows you. <laughs> and yeah. that's something that, that I was taught. So the, you, you, will f- you have to go with this, again, growth mindset that there are people out there who can really help you expand and grow it does take a bit of searching, but once you find them, they're absolutely invaluable. Absolutely, and I, th- and I think that's the the great thing about online networking. I mean, networking. I mean, LinkedIn is um, I, when I when I switch my mindset from seeing it as an online CV to seeing it as a a networking uh, platform. Then uh, I think I, I took off then, and you know, I've met people like you, and uh, you know, a load of other people on LinkedIn and uh, built some incredible relationships and friendships uh, across the whole world. And it's uh, blown my mind, to be honest, in the last three years, how, how that's powerful. And um, as you say, you never know where these are going to lead and what kind of, uh, I mean, like you've ta- taught me a lot about, you know, coaching and, and mindset through our conversations. And, uh, you know, I've had other conversations where I've learned such a lot. So um, I think that's worth, uh, definitely worth, uh, you know, thinking about as well. Uh, absolutely. And, and that's actually, it's great that you mentioned LinkedIn in terms of, I would, I would say, I would like to hope if someone was to mention accounting exams around the world, mm-hmm. I would like to think I mentioned there somewhere along the line. Yeah. Um, and I've only ever met two other people who do what I do. Yeah. It's crazy. And, well, I, I don't understand that because it's, uh, you know, when I saw you as like exam coach, I thought, yeah, that absolutely makes sense. You know, the, uh, there, there, there are many learning providers out there. Yeah. There are many people who will teach you the technical material. Yeah. But if you were a boxer or if you were going to the gym, you get a, you get a coach. Yeah. So why shouldn't there be one about accounting exams? Um, and the, the benefit of it is, is uh, I mean, it's, it's not just for the exams as well, because what you're doing is actually teaching people. It's, so it's not like a revision course. So there's these revision courses where, you know, the tutors will you know, give practice questions. And I know you do that as, as well. But, um, you know, what you're doing on top of that is teaching people the right mindset and getting really under the skin and actually giving them self-motivation which is something that's going to be really powerful for, for the rest of their life, not just let alone exams and career. So um, I think that's where, you know, the, the sort of uh, coaching comes in and exam coaching can just be a start of it. What, what I would say, Andy, the first two modules I have 
for the exam coaching, the PASS protocol, and it's a very similar two modules for the career development, which is called the Clear Career Accelerator. Yeah. Those two modules alone, I give my clients information to help them change their lives. It is as simple as that. Yeah. Now, I never say I can change their lives in two modules because I don't do that. Yeah. But what I can do is I can give the client information to go, hold on, start mind to actually work like that. Mm. And therefore, I can go and adopt principles and practices to go and change things. Yeah. And the reason why I know that and the reason why I can say that so confidently, Andy, is because five years ago, I had to change the way I was thinking. And yeah. these are the things that I took on board to help gain, gain clarity where I was going. So yeah. that's where, yes, I've been there and done that and I've worn the t-shirt and I want to help as many as people as possible to, to do that. Yeah. And and the, what, what I would say in terms of my what I do, I don't want to train the next generation of accountants. Mm. What I want to do is I want to help the next generation of dynamic business professionals go and do yeah. what they want to do. Yeah. It just happens to be my niche in accounting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's where, where it's different, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, I, could you give a couple of examples, say, of, of people that uh, have experienced a real, like, um, uh, shift and made, where coaching's made a big difference for them, you know, and, and what was it that triggered that, that uh, success and that kind of paradigm shift for them, if you like? One guy in particular, he is possibly one of my greatest success stories. Mm. Um, and essentially, he got in contact with me a couple of years ago. He had delayed his professional exams for many, many years, yeah. the, the last paper, for many years, and was getting to the point now where he was getting time-bound by that paper, and he had to get it done. Mm. But he hadn't studied for years, um, and he was in a bit of a rut with, with other elements of his life. And I'd asked him that particular question, one of the first questions, I asked my clients and they was why are you doing this yeah and I said look come back to me in the next session and we'll talk about that a bit more and he came back to me and he said Andy to make my daughters proud that refra that reframes everything yeah reframes everything that means every single day I said that means every single day you see your two daughters that will give you a push in the right direction to get this to pass this paper and lo and behold he passed the paper and he is a group FD and a global advocate for an accountancy body. That's fantastic. That's one of the greatest success stories. And it's simply, it was, uh, it was just that one question that changed everything because he was able to look at it in a very different way. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's uh, amazing what, uh, what difference it makes when you, when you remember the reason that you're doing things. Absolutely. That was a, that was a huge success. Now, I didn't get him to pass that exam. He done it. Yeah. He done it. That's, uh, that's the thing. Yeah, that's the, that's uh, that's the key thing, isn't it? With with coaching, it's sort of uh, you, you don't do anything for people. You just get them to do it themselves and get to that them to realise that they can do it themselves. Absolutely. And a quick one, just in terms of the biggest success of career coaching, was sure. this this lady wanted to do very well in her in, in the coaching profession. She was in one of the bigger firms yeah. and <laughs> through a conversation with myself, she went and opened up her own boutique tax planning practice. Oh, wow. Because whenever I had a conversation with her, she realized, no, I don't want to be part of this. Perfect. I don't want to be part of the, the big four anymore. I really yeah. enjoyed it while I could, but you know something, I've got a family and I would like to do it on my terms. Yeah. And she opened her own ta boutique tax planning practice from our house brilliant so Actually, it's, it's it's hard work saying that in your own business isn't it i mean as you and i both know absolutely but she's had this flexibility now that she never had before yeah. Uh, yeah. It's fantastic she can spend more time with her family etc it's great yeah and actually it was talking to you that actually uh, made her realize that that's what she really wanted and and not the career pro progression and she got to the root of really why it was she was dissatisfied with where she was probably because that's what happened to me right yeah that's what happened and you were able to give some of your own experience to to help with that which gives you that
credibility. Absolutely. Again, it's going back, Andy, to I've done it the hard way. I didn't know what I was doing. Still don't sometimes. <laughs> and that's fine. And that's fine. Yeah. But as long as you give it a try and you learn as you go along. You know, one, one thing I'm trying to learn now is being a salesperson. Yeah. I'm trying to, which is a very difficult for us accountants. It is. Yeah. We're, we're perhaps good. Uh, we're great at technical stuff. We're great, great at, our, at our invoicing. Great at drawing up courses and, and something that's logical. But now yeah. trying to be the salesperson and say, look, I can really help you develop. Yeah. That's their difficult conversations to have with people. Yeah. Uh, I, that's something I'm trying to learn and develop. And I was telling her that, mm. and I was saying, "Look, I'm the sw- I'm like the swan. I'm going gracefully along here, but my legs are going crazy underneath. Yeah. So I'm trying to learn as I go along as well. Yeah, and that that's that's fine. Um, but I the- think that's a that's a good thing for accountants to learn. Actually, I think uh, um, I think as you were saying earlier, for accountants sort of to go out and set their own businesses up, really, and then uh, discover. You know the the relationships with marketing and sales uh, with accountants are often not the best. But no, um, no, no. once you understand all the trial and error and the uh, you know the testing and the you know um, is this going to work or is that going to work and nobody quite knows. And you know the accountants coming along and saying, "But you must know, you must know the risk of this." You know, and it's like, no, sometimes you don't. Um, and sometimes you just, just have to take a punt and see how it goes and not put too much money at risk. And it's uh, uh, <laughs> a lot less straightforward than, uh, than we often used to think. Absolutely. And even myself, Andy, I've, you know, I've had to get those invoices through at year end for my own business. I've yeah. had to chase debt from clients. Yeah. I've had to have, I've actually had to resign from clients. Right. Uh, I, I, I've, I've had to learn all this. I've had yeah. to learn how to draw up an engagement letter for my own business. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. Um, put proposal documents together, do yeah. webinars, um, yeah. do your, you know, put up videos on LinkedIn, do podcasts. Yeah. I've had to learn how to do all that. Yeah. Um, and it's actually sometimes it's not like work because I enjoy it so much. Yeah. Which again makes you feel guilty because we're conditioned into the fact that that's not necessarily work. Exactly. You, you, because there's you, no char- because there's no chargeable hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I mean, have you had examples as well? Just going back to the coaching examples, where where coaching hasn't worked so well. I mean, what? I know we were talking uh, uh, last week about uh, one one example. I mean, why why was that? Yeah, I've had uh, I've had to resign uh, a couple of clients because yeah. the good old saying: you can bring a horse to water, but you don't you can't make them drink. Yeah, exactly. and and you know I am very comfortable. I, I have also been told, you know, there's a saying: "There's no such thing as a stupid question." Yeah, which is fine. Or like an old boss said to me, "You can't get sued for asking a stupid question." Yeah, exactly. No, that's great if you ask the question once, twice, perhaps three times. <laughs> but the same problem is recurring time after time after time, which yeah. had happened for a couple of these clients. I had to resign. Yeah. Because the the advice wasn't getting through. Mm. Like that's a mental block that you can only do so much to get through. Um, and there was an issue there in terms of mentality, in terms of mindset. And I had tried everything, and I had to just get to the point and say, "Look, I can't do any more here." Yeah. Um, because it's not doing you any good, or 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 me any good. And I had to have those conversations more than once. And sometimes, Andy, it sometimes it works out for the best because I have had one one guy in particular who left the mm. profession, left the profession, and did realise that it wasn't for him. And that's great. That's actually a yeah. bit of a success. That's something yeah. where I had to resign, but it led out to a good success for them. Yeah, sure, sure. So. Yeah, you have to have those difficult conversations. It's not nice having those conversations. You have to say to someone, do you know something? This may not be for you. But do you think that, um, you know, with one of those, uh, the first one you were talking about, it was uh, more down to kind of a, a fixed mindset. If, you've, if you've heard somebody saying something time and time again, but you haven't done anything about it, someone with a growth mindset, I think, would say, oh, I'll give it a try. And um, but someone with a fixed mindset is just saying no, that's not going to work. You know, it's not going to work for me. 
I know that because yeah. I'm, I'm a failure. I'm, you know, you're not going to be able to get a success out of me. So do you think it was like a, like a fixed mindset thing? Absolutely. What was that? Was it Einstein that said insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same result? So, something like that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, the same thing is expecting to get a different result. Or getting, yeah. Uh, but in this case, it was doing. It was trying to get advice of a coach, being told to do something else, but doing the same thing and getting the same result, which was a failure. Yeah. And, that's that was the thing. It wasn't open enough to yeah. say, okay, there's maybe something else here, and it, it showed through. It showed through. And look, hindsight's a wonderful thing as well. And again, on my lear- on my learning is that I love working with people who are open to learn. Yeah, you have that growth mindset. I want to take everything else on board. It's quite difficult working with people with having that fixed mindset. Yeah, that's the reason why I say to anyone the biggest priority that you have is developing. It's coming with an open mindset to go and learn and develop uh, new things, new experiences. That is a, that is a, a, a big thing though. So, so um, uh, it's kind of how do you get somebody who's in that fixed mindset into that growth mindset? So that's, that's a very tricky thing because uh, there are some people who just literally don't believe in themselves, but um I, I absolutely agree with that, but Andy, my 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 suggestion in terms of people who who say, "Oh, I can't grow," yeah. is to develop one word, a one word question: Why? Mm. Everything that you deal with, if you ask the question "Why," you yeah. automatically become into growth mindset. Automatically, <laughs> it's just yeah. asking what. It's just asking why often enough and not accepting. I was very. I was very accepting of things up until mm. five years ago, Andy. Very, very accepting of things. I just went, that's how things work. But yeah. then whenever certain things happen to you in your life, and whenever you embrace it then to say, okay, this is tough, but let's see where I go with this and ask the yeah. questions why, that changes things dramatically. Yes. So it's having that open and questioning mindset. So if you're fixed, ask the question why of every given scenario things mm. change yeah so what would you say to somebody who may be thinking about um uh maybe thinking they need a coach um and wondering whether it's worth the money what what would you say to kind of try and tip them towards uh you know seeing it as a positive thing before you would do that andy i would have conversations with a number of people yeah because different people have got different opinions mm. different coaches what what i'm trying to say is essentially try and have a conversation with a number of people to try and pinpoint the person that fits your style right so where where i come along is i'm 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 okay in terms of modifying my approach occasionally Mm. sometimes i can be very much right you've got to go and do that Mm. i I give someone a kick in the ass Mm -hmm. on other occasions i may be quite good at putting the arm around around someone and saying okay Let's talk about this and get another approach. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is you need to perhaps try a few different people in terms of a coach or mentor until you find someone who is your style. Yeah. And yeah. that could be a first phone call with someone. Like, you know, yeah. a lot of coaches like ourselves who maybe offer a free consultation, maybe a free chat. Yeah. Take advantage, take advantage of those conversations. Yeah. And try and find someone who, who, who matches what you're looking for. Yeah, sure. Great. Thanks for that. About all that stuff about coaching and, and mentoring. That's really uh, all valuable stuff. Uh, and I hope it gives people um, food for thought, really, um, in, in terms of... Uh, well, one one thing, Andy, is. just in terms of talking about that as a coach, I think as a coach and a mentor, if we can give our clients awareness, an absolutely key thing. It's an awareness of, of different aspects. Yeah. And then it's up to sensibly to the individual to take that awareness on board. To, to move forward from that so that's a key word to everything is awareness awareness that's right and yeah that's right awareness of themselves and awareness of uh, options and opportunities and all sorts of things absolutely so let's talk about other things um you do a podcast uh, i believe called james perry presents um do. nothing to do with accounting <laughs> what's the concept it's, of that 
Well, and why do oh. you do it? That's a great question. I do it, Andy, because I enjoy it. It's yeah. as simple as that. <laughs> it's as simple as that. <laughs> I love talking to people and hearing their stories. I love asking people questions. How it started oh, was about a little over two years ago where I interviewed my dad. I literally just done it for, for the crack. I done it for the enjoyment. I done it for, so I said to my dad, come on here, we, we go on Facebook Live. And we'll just, I'll ask you questions for an hour. Yeah. A part, partly it was for posterity as well to just keep, to have some memories of my dad and, and to record yeah. a video. He didn't realize what he was doing. He didn't know what the <laughs> internet was. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to know. No. So I done it down there and I got, I got eight, nearly 8,000 views on Facebook Live. And I went, what? So I started then contacting a few people on LinkedIn, contacting mm. um, a few local friends of mine, and it got known as James Perry Presents. Right. And then off the back of that, I done a couple of coffee shop events off the back of that, so a few networking events. Right. And I really loved it. I really enjoyed it. And then what happened, Andy, was that people started to know me for who I was. I wasn't just James, the accountant, or yeah. James, the coach. Uh, people then started to get to know me as well. Yeah, so yeah. In, in, indirectly, I was building an even bigger network. I didn't realize I was doing it. Right. So off the back of that, and then off the back of that, I'd done about 16 or 17 interviews. And I found out that, and this is again for people who want to, to build content and to repurpose things. I found that you could save a Facebook Live interview, you could upload it to YouTube, and you could also convert it into an MP3. Therefore, for one bit of work, you got three things. Uh. So I had the YouTube channel and I had the podcast, but it was a massive success in Facebook Live. So I'd done that, but then I quit for about 16 months. Right. Because it wasn't really paying. It was for enjoyment. There was no money coming. Yeah. So I had to focus on the business and my, my university role as well. Mm. But lo and behold, over the last um, three weeks to a month, I said, right, let's give this another go. I have branded it. Again, James Perry presents. I've got the logos designed. I've got the Facebook group. Um, it isn't as ad hoc anymore. It's going to be every other week. Yeah. And I've got lots of guests. I've actually got, if all the guests say yes, I have enough, enough guests lined up for August to August 2021. <laughs> brilliant. That is brilliant. <laughs> if they all say yes. <laughs> and so again, it's, about basically, it's basically about just hearing people's uh, life stories and interesting yeah. things. Um, Absolutely. I mean, what's, what are the biggest things you've learned through doing that? I mean, you must have talked to some really interesting people. Talk a lot, including your dad as well, obviously. Oh, my dad was fantastic. My dad, and I'm going to do part two with him. Um, right. It has led on to me trying to pressurize him to write a book. Um, right. That that will happen. In terms of other things, the biggest learning I have is that nothing's true. And what do I mean by that? I mean that your reality is different from my reality. Mm. So. What we're seeing out there, we've all got different perceptions. Maybe I should say not, maybe I should say there are different perceptions of things. Yeah. So, you know, and that's what I've seen. Everybody's story is different. Yeah. And everybody loves talking about themselves. <laughs> you, also, <laughs> you know, everybody loves talking about themselves. Yeah. Um, and I just, I've interviewed some great people. So I've interviewed not just my dad, but I interviewed a, a lady called Natalia Vihovsky, who's like a LinkedIn superstar. I've interviewed right. her. I've interviewed a guy called Mark Asquith, who's one of the biggest podcasters in, in Great Britain. I've interviewed a guy called Brad Burton, who is um, oh, yeah. the, Brad, yeah. the top 50 entrepreneurs in, in GB. Yeah. Um, I've interviewed, who have I interviewed here? Some local friends of mine. One yeah. guy done was the first Westerner to do a particular type of fire walk in Thailand. Um, I've interviewed a guy two weeks ago who worked for Gary Vaynerchuk in New York. Right. I interviewed a guy last night who is a transformational breathing specialist. Wow. Um, who's taken that role on board over the last five years. But before that, 
He was the number one archaeologist in Ireland and in the top five marine archaeologists in the world. Wow. But, and I, and so I know archaeology is something you're, you're really interested in as well, isn't it? Massive into my history. Yeah. Um, I am blessed to, Ireland is just awash with history, yeah. awash with ancient monuments. You know, where I come from, Andy, is a village called Lochan Island, which yeah. the, Ar the Irish is Lochan Island, the, the island in the lake. Right. And our burial ground is actually on an island with three ruined churches, and the middle church is 900 years old. Gosh. And people, so that just, that just really fostered in me a massive um, love of history. Yeah, yeah. One, mile, one mile down the road from that, there is a burial chamber that's three and a half thousand years old. And seven miles from my house is the grave of St. Patrick. Wow. So St. Patrick is buried seven miles away from my house. <laughs> arguably, <laughs> arguably the most famous saint in the world. And he is seven miles away. Yeah. So, you know, the place is absolutely teeming with history here. Um, and, I, and I love it. Yeah, well, I, I guess it uh, it fits with the you, you get fascinated by the different um, like paradigms and the different uh, ways that they thought. And if you're if you're talking to people on the podcast nowadays who have different perceptions and different ways of looking at things, you you look back in history and they've got all sorts of different ways of looking at things and things that they didn't know that we know now and and, and stuff like that. It is fascinating. Uh, and where I'm going with this. James Perry presents initially, Andy was all about business, and that's grand. That's that's fine. Yeah. But now I just want to hear about people's stories. So yeah. I've got, for example, in the next few weeks, I have got a lady who just won uh, BBC's Best Home Cook that television program. Right. I coached her through her accountancy exams. <laughs> Excellent. And she she won uh, BBC's Best Home Cook. I have got a guy who owns a group called Mythical Ireland, who yeah. has got about 60,000 people in this Facebook group. He's an absolute, he's, he's, he's an authority in Irish mythology. Mm. Um, I have got an actor who was one of the priests on Father Ted. Now, not one of the main priests, but one of the sort of side priests. I've got him coming on. Excellent. And then yourself, you're coming on as well. Hopefully it's something. Yeah. Hopefully <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but everybody's got different stories. Uh, that's yeah. the fascinating thing about things. It is. It's brilliant. Well, thank you very much for, for all that time and the, and the, and the valuable um, uh, lessons that you've, you've shared with, with everybody. And uh, let's get that out there and, uh, and try and help people in, uh, in thinking about their accountancy and their you know, coaching and mentoring and all those kind of decisions. And, um, career decisions um, and see if we can help them get in the right direction. Absolutely. Thanks, James. Thank you very much. I loved it. Thank you. <laughs>